to see if in the next 18 minutes I can challenge you or uh, inspire you or encourage you to become an effective storyteller. You know, we've spoken so much about stories and, and how stories are so important and whatnot, but I want you to become an effective storyteller, not because it's creative or a fun thing to do, but because unless you're an effective storyteller, you'll never be relevant. Effectively telling stories is the only way that you can be relevant. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You could be uh, a business person or an entrepreneur. You could be a socialpreneur. You could be an activist, a, pol a politician, or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what, what it is that you're trying to do unless you can wrap your idea around a story that people want to hear and that people believe, then you're going to be irrelevant. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it doesn't matter what your goal is either. I mean, you could, your goal might be to make a million dollars or change a million lives or improve a million people or whatever it is. But as long as you can't wrap your idea around a story, we're not going anywhere. <sighs> okay. <laughs> you know, so much has been said about stories already, but we've also been talking about ideas. And ideas are really, really powerful things. Um, in fact, one person said that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And it's true. But an idea is only powerful if it can spread. For as long as the idea stays in your head or on your shelf or in your wallet, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to develop influence. It's not going to create power. It's not going to create the difference that we want. Not, a, not as Zimbabwean, not in your business, not as a person, not anything. Does that make sense? So let me tell you a story about telling stories. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a baker man, a baker. And this guy was a pretty good baker. In fact, in his mind, he was the greatest baker who ever lived. That's what he thought. And so uh, the problem is that he wasn't known. No one knew him, but he thought, you know, it's, that's okay. No one knows me for now, but if I keep at it, I keep working hard, if I keep doing my thing, sooner or later, people are bound to notice that my cookies are you know, a little bit better than the next guy's cookies, and you know, I'll make a difference. And a lot, of be a lot of business people think that way as well. A lot of you guys think that way as well. Artists they think, well, you know, if enough people see this nice red thing that I've got going on there, you know, if enough people see that my product is like this, or if, not people, if enough people see that my service is a little bit better, then sooner or later, I should gain enough momentum and I'll take over the world. Some people think that way. Anyway, Mr. Baker, after dozens of, no, hundreds of experiments, he finally comes up where he gives birth to an idea that he believes could possibly be the greatest chocolate, cook, cook, cho chocolate chip cookie ever made. He's ecstatic. He tastes, this, he tastes this thing. He starts doing cast wheels around his kitchen table. He's doing star jumps. He's so excited. He can see millions of dollars coming in, global fame, all kinds of things. He's excited. You know, and then he calls his wife in, she tastes it, she goes crazy. Ah, oh, star jump, Ooh, wow, wow, reaches at last. He calls the kids in, same thing. So they're so excited, this amazing idea that they have. It's such an important idea, it's such an, such an amazing idea. And so he bakes up a bunch of quickies, next day hits the market, packs up his, his donkey cart, you know, rides into the market, and he goes and he... He, he goes to his stall and he packs all his, he puts all his, his chocolate chip cookies there on the table and he starts to, to shout uh, the same thing that all the other bakers next to him are saying. You know, come and taste my cookies. These are the best cookies you've ever tasted. Seriously, my wife loves them. Seriously, my kids love them. Come and taste these cookies. 10% discount, hurry while stocks last, all that sort of thing. And that's what he's saying. And of course, because people have heard that same thing over and over again, and because it's exactly what the next guy is saying, and the next guy is saying, and the next guy is saying, people do exactly what they do when you say what everyone else is saying. They ignore you. And so everyone looked back and they said, yeah, much. another guy with the best chocolate chip cookies. Another guy with the most amazing chocolate whatever. And, and so they ignored him. But anyway, just then, uh, coming up over the horizon, people see that there's a royal chariot on the way. So they wait, and the royal chariot arrives, and uh, they find that in the royal chariot is not actually a king, but is another baker. And next to this baker is the most beautiful woman that any of the people they have ever seen. You know, long blonde hair, luscious lips, perfect shapes in all the right places, everything. You know, so there she is, this beautiful woman. And this baker, he says, he motions for, for silence. And people say, shh, 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 let's hear what this guy has to say. Look at that woman, man. <laughs> you know, I, but all the other bakers, they're still trying to sell their stuff. Guys, discount, discount, 10%. Hurry, stocks last. These are amazing. These, and people are like, shh, quiet. You need to hear what these guys are saying. And so this other baker, he starts talking. And he tells them a story about how he comes from a far, far away kingdom uh, where he served uh, the king, a very, very wealthy, but a very, very wicked king, an evil king. And how this king for 20 years had kept him as a, as a slave 
And, you know, there he was, you know, baking cookies every day. And, you know, when you're serving the king, it's, a different, it's different than serving the people because, you know, you mess up just one, one recipe and that could mean, you know, your head off. So he became a pretty good baker because of that. And over all these years, he'd been, he'd been, you know, working with dozens of experiments and all kinds of things until finally he came up with what was the best chocolate chip cookie the world had ever known. And of course, the king tasted it, and the king goes crazy. He starts doing star jumps around his throne. Woo, 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 woo. He starts rolling around, all kinds of things. It's so exciting. The king says to him in his drunken state, look, if you will bake me 1,000 of these chocolate chip cookies, I promise you, you have your freedom. Not only you, you and your whole family, and your tax, be exempt from tax for the rest of your life. Well, that's major motivation for this uh, baker. So he gets cooking, you know, he gets baking, you know, three days, three nights, he's nonstop. But on the third night, something terrible happens. One of the sympathetic guards comes and reveals to the baker that, you know, the king has no intention of letting you go. Actually, now more than ever, he's going to keep you because now you're making these chocolate chip cookies. Not only that, but this evil, wicked, you know, satanic king, what he's going to do now, he's going to force your beautiful daughter to become his 500th concubine. Well, that's, you know, that was horrible for him. So he thought, well, you know what I'm going to do then? That's it. You know, so there he packs up all the chocolate chip cookies. He packs up his, his, his daughter, who is his only remaining relative, and they risk life and limb to escape from this kingdom. And there they are. They've traveled seven days and seven nights, and here they are. They're finally at this village where they've come to start a new life and to sell the chocolate chip cookies. Now, these chocolate chip cookies are made fit for a king. These chocolate chip cookies have been used. They've used ingredients that the common baker, and he points to all the other bakers, you know, these guys, the common beggar could never afford the kind of ingredients that went into this chocolate chip cookie. These things were made, you know, with, with, with my life at stake. These things were made because, you know, all, all kinds of things. But, you know, and, and he says that all I want from you guys, if, if you're a lover of justice and freedom, if you, <laughs> if you appreciate, you know, if you appreciate food, food for a king, and I can't help her, but I can't, I can't help it, but my daughter has vowed to give the man who buys the most chocolate chip cookies her hand in marriage. <laughs> he says, you know, if you appreciate true beauty, all I ask is that you, you come and you buy my chocolate chip cookies. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Who do you think sold the most chocolate chip cookies that day? <laughs> it's a very simple thing. Now the other guy was out there saying, you know, chocolate chip cookie, amazing, 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 amazing. It's like you look at the Herald, the newspaper. You guys have seen it. If you look at the classified section, every single ad looks the same. Computers for sale, uh, cell phones for sale, uh, house for sale, everything. 10% discount. Haribo stocks, it's all the same message. People aren't telling a story. But the person who tells a story always wins. I want to confirm your worst fear. Right now, that person sitting next to you is crazy. Not only him or her, but every single person in this crowd. Take, take a moment to take it in. You see, we, we like to think of ourselves as being logical people. But we're not logical. We're emotional. We respond to stories. We respond to stories. We respond to the way that, to the stories that we've been told about what we should believe about any situation. Right now, you're already telling a story. Maybe, not very, very, maybe you're not very good at it, but you're already telling a story. Your skin, teller, skin color tells a story about you. You know, when I see that you're a certain skin color, my worldview tells me a story about you long before you say anything. When I look at your clothes, or the cologne that you're wearing, or the accent that you speak with, or the vocabulary that you use, it's already telling me a story about you. Does that make sense? And unless you give me a better story, or a more important story to hear, about who you are, about what you can do, what you can contribute, then I'm going to believe the story that I've always had. You know, look at, we just heard you know, about uh, Coca-Cola, for example. You know, they, the effectiveness of their marketing was based on them being able to tell stories and associate their product with a story about the kind of lifestyle that you can achieve or the kind of lifestyle that you can have. It's aspirational. That's what they did, and it's effective, and it works all over the world. You know, if you buy a Coca-Cola, uh, well, let me ask you this, rather. If you, you know, <laughs> you know, what is the difference between buying a Coke uh, for one dollar at, a, at a, say, uh, the latest Sazda joint, Kwame Fafi somewhere, 
you're going to buy it for a dollar. But yes, we're happy to buy that same exact Coca-Cola for $3 at the Meekles. What is the difference? It's not the product. It's the same value, isn't it? The difference is the story. And that's exactly what it is for you. Unless you can become proficient and effective at telling a story about what you do, unless you can become proficient at telling a story about what you can contribute, then you, you're not going to be relevant. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? Yes. You know, uh, <laughs> Zimbabwe right now, we're at a place, like has been mentioned over and over again, where we need people who can step up and tell stories about our nation. Uh, we've heard over and over again that the world has a world view about us, that they see us as uh, victims, or they see us as the suffering Africans that need to be rescued, or they see us as all kinds of things, you know. And for as long as we aren't telling a story, or for as long as we aren't effective at getting our story across, as long as we can't package our ideas and transport them with stories, that, that's only going to continue. You know, but if we collectively, and if we individually, in your business, uh, in your NGO, uh, in your politic, political campaign, or whatever it is, unless you become effective at telling that story, unless you become effective at managing the perceptions that people have, uh, unless you become effective at uh, portraying who you, want, who you want people to see, then you're not going to be very effective, and you're not going to be relevant. So that's my challenge for you today. You know. Work on, work on finding out what your story is. And there's all kinds of things that we can talk about, about how to, how to be effective or how to be good at telling a story. There's all sorts of things. You know, a good place to start is to understand the worldview that you're dealing with. You know, it's, it's no use. You know, I did this when I was early in business. You know, I'd step up, and I knew what I was talking about, sort of, you know. But I'd, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd walk into a boardroom, you know, I was a little younger, and I'd walk into a boardroom, and I'd say all the right things. You know, I'd say it with passion, gusto. You know, and you, and you, could, you could look at the facts and you'd say, yeah, he, he's right. That probably is the truth. But, you know, I, I'd be wearing a T-shirt sometimes and, and I'm sitting to people, I'm talking to people who are wearing suits uh, or, you know, I, 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 sometimes I'd be chewing gum and all kinds of things. <laughs> and the problem was not what I was saying because what I was saying was factual and accurate. The problem was the story that I was telling with the way that I was dressed. The problem was that even though they knew the facts of what I was saying were accurate, they just couldn't get past the world view that I'd given, that, that, that I'd painted myself in. They couldn't get past that perspective that, but a young kid in a t-shirt just can't tell me, an executive who's been doing this for 20 years, what to do. He, he can't, even though he knew what I was saying was right, he just couldn't get past it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it's, so it's so important, it's so vital that you design by intention your story. We have to design it by intention. We can't leave it to chance. We can't leave it to chance. You know, and right now, what we're seeing is that you know, the, model, the model for marketing has changed in the world. You know, it used to be uh, way back when newspaper was the only way or radio was the only way to communicate that marketers would stand on top of the mountain and say, behold, amazing product, amazing product. And it was a one-way conversation. Now things are changing. Now we're so connected. Now the internet allows us to get on Twitter, to get on Facebook. Now we're getting mobile technology, and everyone has a, a, a means of communication in their hands. We're more connected than ever before. And so it's up to you to tell a story that not only, uh, <laughs> that not only people believe in and want to hear, that, but people want to share. And the way to do that, of course, is by telling a great story. Well, the way to do that really is by having a great idea in the first place. You know, if your chocolate chip cookie really is junk, then a story might not help you. you know, but if it actually is worth telling, if it actually is worth tasting, if your story really is important, if you really do believe in what you say you believe in, then it's worth and it's absolutely vital and it's mandatory, in fact, that you sit down and decide what your story should be and who you need to tell it to and how you're going to convince them of it. All right? Thank you. <laughs>